Thanks for joining us at the virtual Mark Twain Library. Um, as we head into winter with surging COVID rates, we are so pleased to welcome this evening's speaker, Leslie Cohen Rubery, who is a licensed clinical social worker. Over the next hour and a half, she is going to share with us some practical advice to help us manage these emotional ebbs and flows of living through these turbulent times. Um, Leslie, I know many of you know Leslie. She is, um, holds a master's in social work as well as a master's in special education. She has spent 39 years experience 30, she has 39 years of experience working with families and children in schools and community settings. She has a private practice in Reading where she provides individual family and marital therapy. Leslie holds an ongoing parenting groups and regular, regularly conducts workshops and lectures in the community. She is intensively trained in dialectic behavior therapy and now leads several DBT skills groups for adults, teenagers, and their families. So before we begin, just a few housekeeping details. We are a large group tonight, so the audience is muted. Um, and we have turned off the chat just so we have um, one place to communicate, and that's gonna be through the Q&A function. Um, we want to hear your questions throughout the evening, so please feel free to put them in the Q&A at any time, and then Leslie will answer those at the end. So the Q&A function is um, down at the bottom in the menu bar at the bottom of your screen. So we are also recording this evening's program. And so it's gonna be available on our YouTube channel in about a week. So there's no need to furiously take notes. And if your friends and neighbors were not able to join us this evening, please let them know that they can find this on the, on the library's YouTube channel. So now without further ado, I'd like to hand things over to Leslie. It is the library's honor to welcome you, Leslie. Thank you for sharing your time and your expertise with the community tonight. Thank you so much, Elaine. And thank you, Mark Twain Library for inviting me and hosting this program and so many other fantastic programs that have been on throughout the uh, pandemic. I mean, I've certainly attended more library events than I have in the past, which, um, which is just fantastic that this is being offered out to more and more families, uh, which is my goal in the work that I do. So I'm thrilled to be here. And another logistic is that I have a slide presentation that I will be going through tonight, but some of it is gonna be oral and sometimes I am gonna refer back to the slides. However, if you want a copy of the whole slide set, you are more than welcome to go to my website and just download those handout, that handout, those slides. Um, and I'll say my website now, and I'll say it again at the end. It's lesliecohenruberry.com. So it's my name.com. That's my website. And on the resource page, you'll find these, um, the slide presentation, because I'm only going to show some of them tonight, but everything I talk about is on the slides. So happy to have you get them. Um, as we said we're recording and it will be available to share with other people. I appreciate that you do get to share it with other people. Uh, this is, um, it, I'm gonna start off with some of the practice right now because one of the things about giving presentations is I am an extrovert and I love interacting with people. So I see people in the audience and it feeds me and I get very energized and right now, and. All I've got is a screen in front of me and a green dot. <laughs> I got the advice, look at the green dot. I don't do well with green dots. However, one of the things, one of the tricks that I'm going to teach you tonight and one of the skills is to add the magic and. Like, I don't really like talking to a screen and I'm thrilled to be getting this information out to you. So as we talk about um, the pandemic and skills that we can use during these difficult times with our intense emotions. Um, I'm practicing right now with that dialectic statement that I just made of, this is really hard to talk to a screen and a green dot, knowing that you're out there. I'd love to see your faces. And at the same time, I'm thrilled that this information is getting out there you for you and for anyone you'd like to share it with. Um, why DBT skills? What am I doing? What am I planning to share tonight? Well, tonight I've decided that um, because we're talking about these surging, surging uh, emotions at, in the surging pandemic, I have my little rowboat here um, and the rowboat would not be useful and it would not be very effective if it didn't have the oars. The oars are the skills that help us navigate. 
So in a rowboat, I'm going to be, whether I'm in turbulent waters or whether I'm in calm waters, I want to move forward. I want to navigate it. I want to be able to handle all of this. And in order to handle it, these oars are my tools. So I have chosen tonight in talking with you to share what are called DBT skills. The oars are the life skills. The life skills are DBT skills. What is DBT? DBT is dialectic behavior therapy. I am, I, many of you know of me from the parenting. I've been in town for 23 years. I've done parenting classes here. I so have enjoyed those for 22 years. And um, now I'm talking, which is a little different. I'm talking to you as individuals. You may have children that you're concerned about tonight, but you're here for yourself um, and maybe for your children or whoever. And DBT skills are life skills that are good for everyone. They're not just good for me, for you. They're good for everyone. And these um, skills are teach us how to be effective in our lives, how to get what we want, how to regulate our emotions, how to stay focused, how to navigate uh, intense relationships, situations. And these are the skills that I teach in weekly groups that I've been teaching for about 13, 15 years. I don't know exactly how many. I've been teaching DBT groups uh, ongoing for this whole time and it's continuous. I've never stopped. The groups keep going because people come in, people go out, people come in going out. It's people for you and I. But the one thing I do want to share is that DBT skills group is one part of this incredible uh, therapy treatment program called dialectic behavior therapy. It's a much more comprehensive program than just the skills. And that's not what I need to teach because here we're just working on everyday issues that we're learning to navigate. Um, DBT was developed by Marsha Linehan in the 80s, 1980s. She's brilliant. It's a incredibly helpful um, therapy program that helps people deal with intense emotions who have very dysregulated behaviors. And um, it makes a really incredible difference in these people's lives. So I mentioned that I do the groups. I mentioned that in the groups, they last the, the whole course for DBT is about four, 40 weeks, 10 months. And what's interesting about that is there are four modules and people drop their jaw and go, you're kidding. That's a long time. Just as we've been here in COVID, we're saying it's almost been two years. Amazing, a long time. And at the end of the 40 weeks, people often say, oh, I don't want it to end. And some people actually want to continue. So there's a ton of skills. And two minutes before I got on uh, screen here with you, I was laying down doing my mindfulness to um, settle my body, get ready for the talk, become aware of where I was. And I noticed all my mind, my mind started having lots of thoughts go on. And during that time, I was thinking, oh my God, there's so many more, there's so many more skills I want to teach everyone. So I got a little flooded, a little overwhelmed with the idea that there are so many skills. But tonight I'm going to do my best to narrow it down to six or seven skills and make sure that you walk away with some practical information. It's not very good if I say, oh, I'm going to teach you how to play piano. I talk about it, but you don't get to practice it, right? This is a, this, these skills are for doing. These are for practicing. So the idea is that you're going to practice them tonight with me, and then hopefully you go home or you stay home and you practice them over and over and over again. Okay. Um, Goals for tonight. Uh, let's go to my, I'm going to share my screen and um, bring up some of the slides, which some of them I'm going to go through really quickly. I'm not even going to show you, um, but instead I'm going to just click through them and come to this one. All right. I'm going to move myself down here. Okay. So DBTs are effective. They are the skills that effectively help us deal with these intense emotions that we're dealing with in our lives with COVID especially. Um, the feelings range, and this is not an exclusive list. There's so, you know, there's so many more um, 
uh, emotions than just this list here. So it's not an exhaustive list, not an exclusive list. It's not an exhaustive list. There are many more that, as I mention it, you might come up with some of your own. Um, fear and anxiety were so big at the outset of in 2020 when uh, COVID hit. And there's been a journey, and I almost see this journey going down this list a little bit of where we've been and where we are. Not that any of the emotions disappear. They're not first, second, third, they are, they're, they all just keep going. Okay. So there's fear and anxiety, but inside of fear and anxiety, there's panic. There's feeling terrified. There's nervous. There's irritable. There's lots of feelings inside of that fear and anxiety, but there's very good reason for it. We didn't know what was going on. There was so much uncertainty. Then there was an enormous amount of disappointment everything from there's no flour so your child can't get the cupcake they wanted because you had no flour at the store to weddings being canceled to trips being canceled to presentations there was just so much disappointment that people were dealing with all over the place and the grief and the loss was tremendous loss of jobs loss of income loss of life there were many 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 losses loss of a way of normal living so there was a reason to grieve Frustration, anger, and rage, not just at the pandemic, but for everything that was going on in the, around us. And it comes out in small ways. It might not just be anger at the pandemic and the change in life, but it might be the frustration of being home all day with the people you love, but you're not used to being with them all day. So there was so much emotions. And needless to say, there was tremendous overwhelm. Figuring out how to get your groceries, figuring out what to do, um, with your children at home, with your parents that you're worried about, taking care of your work, your life, everything else, changing all of that. So as time went on in this journey, we started to get hopeless, especially through the third, fourth, I'm sorry to say, I don't actually know what surge we're on, but I think it's the fifth, but I'm not sure. Um, one surge after another and hopelessness and helplessness can be big feelings that people are having during this time, especially now. But the last two that I have listed here are ones that I'm concerned about. And I feel like they are newer feelings for this situation. Entrapment, which obviously could have been there from the beginning, where you feel stuck, where you feel you don't know what to do, you can't handle it anymore. That feeling of feeling trapped is one of the worst feelings for mental health. So we wanna make sure that we work on not feeling trapped. Have flexible thinking, which I'm gonna talk about in a little while, where we don't see it in that all or nothing, I can't handle this anymore. That statement makes me feel trapped, okay? So we're gonna maybe change the way we say things. This is never going to get better. Even if I say it feels like it's never gonna go better, I'm less rigid, it's less all or nothing. If I say, it feels like, it, like it's never going to get better and it has gotten better. This too shall get better. It makes a difference. It makes us feel a little more balanced. And the last feeling is burnout. Burnout, this is a new word, COVID fatigue. People are sick and tired of dealing with this. Sick and tired of wearing masks. Sick and tired of having the conversation. Do we get together? Do we not get together? How many hours have you spent on figuring things out? So it's exhausting. There's a lot of burnout happening and there's a way to deal with that. There's a way to deal with all of these intense feelings. But we also have social context that we're dealing with. And I put these conditions on the side. You'll see they make sense in the way I patterned the, the outline for tonight. Uncertainty is everywhere. There's a lot of fear, anxiety, disappointment that comes with uncertainty, change in expectations. You know, there's been a lot of uncertainty. Now, the illusion is it's like we never lived with uncertainty before. And uncertainty is always in our life, right? We never know when we're going to get sick, when we're going to, uh, when something's going to get canceled. But the uncertainty was so front and center when COVID hit because there were so many unknowns. 
Polarization and extremes is so rampant in our society, it's a real problem. We are, and as a result of it, we are feeling more disconnected from people. Uh, we speak in extreme language. It's us versus them. It's good versus bad. It's, there's a lot of extremes and there's a lot of polarization. And even our weather is extreme. I read in the uh, uh, headline was 2020, no, 2021 had the greatest range of temperatures, the hottest temperatures and the coldest temperatures. And we have extremes in weather all over the place that we know we're dealing with. The social injustice, the extremes of seeing what's happening to people, the polarization in our political system, and the what is this, this extreme um, pandemic that we're dealing with, with the numbers of people who are sick and dying. The last area is that is a big concern, also related to um, all of the feelings, is the disconnection that we feel. We feel disconnected from each other, sometimes from ourselves. We can get depressed because we just don't know what to do with ourselves. And then there's the isolation. Even when you are a mentally healthy person, you try doing 10 days of COVID isolation. If you get COVID and you're by yourself in a room, boy, is that tough. And boy, did I hear stories of college kids who were freshmen and they went off to college and then they had to spend 10 days in and they, sometimes they put them in a hotel room or in their dorm room and they weren't allowed out. Boy, that is not what you think of as your freshman year. So people have dealt with this. We've seen mental health um, suffer tremendously. I've Every therapist I've spoken with, including myself, is we're full. People call for help and we're full, but don't stop calling. Keep trying because our schedules change and you can get the help if you need it. So please don't stop reaching out for help if you feel you need it. It is There is no shame in it and there is tremendous support. This is why tonight's talk to get more of you, to reach out to more people is so important to me. Okay. The next, uh, gonna go with this next uh, slide for a minute. We've got the problems I just named, right? We've got all those emotions and we've got COVID and we've got the disconnect and the polarization, we've got all these problems. What do we do? How do people respond? Well, in DBT, we look at different ways of responding to a problem. I'm gonna let you read it. You can accept it and tolerate the problem. A lot of people do not know how to accept and tolerate a problem. Why do I know that they have a hard time with it? Because most people I run into want to fix it. They want to fix, 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 fix problems. Well, COVID is not fixable in the sense that we can get rid of it. COVID is here. COVID is here to stay. And there is a very important part of learning to accept and tolerate what is in front of us. To accept and tolerate that some of us are wearing masks and some of us are not, and some of us wear some of them time and not all of the time. It's a lot, there's a lot of acceptance. We'll get into that more. Another way to respond to a problem is change the way you see it or you perceive it. Those are cognitive skills, changing the way you see it. We'll talk about that. And the third one, which is normally the first, but I've changed the order of these, is fixing problems. Fixing the problem with problem solving. What can we do about it? What will make it better? And so I will talk about that a little bit too, but I saved that for last. Um, number four and five are really important because they are choices. Just like these three, first three are choices for how we respond. Number four is do nothing, stay miserable. Lots of that was happening. I know I got, I got tired of hearing myself complain. I got tired of hearing others complain. It's still happening. Do nothing and stay miserable is a choice you can make. I'm not going to help you with that one tonight. And the last one is making a problem worse. And sadly, that also happened. People were so scared and so overwhelmed and didn't know what to do. There was too much drinking. There was too much avoidance by scrolling for hours on end on the screen. And the screens were helpful because they helped us reach out to people. Um, but there was too much listening to the news. Just listening to the news to such an extent can get you worked up. Be informed, but be balanced. So you know how to make it worse. You know how to do nothing and stay miserable. 
I'm here to work with you on number one, two, and three. Okay, moving on. Um, this is a little chart. And again, I want to remind you that these um, slides and this, these handouts will be on my, are on my website. I'm going to say it again, lesliecohenrewberry.com, and you can find them on the resource page so that you will be able to review these and go over them to juggle your memory of some of the things we talked about. So on the left, we've got the pandemic problems, intense emotions, uncertainty, out of balance, polarization, burnout, disconnect, isolation. There's many more, right? But those are just sort of the three ways I clumped it. Then I just went over the different ways of responding to problems. And then I listed some DBT skills. So we're back to the DBT skills that can help you. Now, as I said, I was laying on the floor right before doing my mindfulness to settle my body, to arrive in my body, to be settled, not to be hyper aroused and too nervous, which I've known to be, I've been known to be. Um, and so as I lay there, I had all these thoughts showing up. I was aware of the thoughts about how many more skills I wanna teach how much more there is to teach. There is a lot to teach and there are always more skills. So I do hope that you walk away with these skills and you practice them and you watch to see what difference these can make. Go for it, it will help. All right, so we're gonna go over all these skills as we proceed. Mindfulness, something called the stop skill, radical acceptance, dialectic thinking, validation, walking the middle path, Emo building an emotional bank, accumulating positive experiences, and building mastery. Okay, uh, we got to stop. And this is where I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second, come back to you guys. Okay, I forgot I was expecting to see you. Um, okay, so one thing I'd like to do right now is I'd actually like to practice a mindfulness skill because we're going to start with mindfulness, which is the first, as you saw, the first EBT skill. Mindfulness is not exactly meditation. And some people think they are synonymous. Meditation is a way of practicing mindfulness. Mindfulness is a broad category. Here's my definition. Paying attention to the present moment on purpose, non-judgmentally. In other words, be present. Be in the here and now. All right. So being present is going to make a difference in your life. The benefits are you reduce your suffering. And I think you're here to find out how to reduce your suffering because the fear, the anxiety, the tension, the anger, whatever you're experiencing, the overwhelm, the grief, the loss. There are times that we need to know how to regulate those emotions and take a break. Just take a break from those emotions. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to practice an exercise, a mindfulness exercise, which is about shifting attention. So try this with me or just listen. You're welcome to, but I sure would encourage you to try it. Start, but normally I start by ringing my bowl, my Tibetan bowl, but we're not going to do that now. Start by looking at something very close to you. I'm going to look at my hands. So I recommend you look at your hands and just take a moment to observe, to notice, to be careful that judgments might show up, but to just notice the judgment and let it go. Go back to looking, be curious about the lines, the sensations, maybe the temperature your, butt, your hands are feeling, but really pay attention for the moment to something right nearby your hands. Now shift your attention to something further away. Look at something further away. Okay, now I happen to be looking at a plant and I'm noticing what I see. And again, just take a moment to observe with some curiosity what's happening right there. You might shift your attention to a sound nearby, maybe a sound far away. Perfect timing, the train whistle just blew, I love it. And come back to your hands for one moment and maybe turn them over 
and thank you for practicing a mindfulness practice. That one is about shifting attention. If you can stand outside, it's a beautiful exercise to shift your attention between sounds, just sounds all around. It's a really fun one. Why do we need to practice mindfulness? Why do we need to practice uh, shifting our attention? Because as I said, and I'm gonna share my screen one more second. As I said, when you, um, when you are got a lot going on in your mind, there is so much going on in your mind. You've got your day to organize. You've got a, your children to take care of or your parents to take care of or your, um, your work is calling for you and you have more things about, are you gonna go away this weekend? Are you not gonna go away this weekend? Are you going to see that person? Are you not gonna see that person? Your mind is full of stuff. And you try to do something nice for yourself, like take a walk. But if your mind is full, then you're not present and you're not taking a walk and you're not being mindful to what you're doing. So you can either have, as this says, a full mind, a mind full of stuff or be mindful. And the reason why we need to do that is we need a break because if you wanna go back and deal with making a wise-minded decision about do I go or do I not go? Do I see this person? Do I not see this person? Should I have should I, you know, what am I going to do for my work, et cetera? As you make decisions, as you deal with your life, you need a break. You need to be able to shift your mind from one thing to another. If you're feeling intense anxiety and you need to get out of the door, you just need to get out of the house to get to that doctor's appointment, but you're feeling intense anxiety, if you pay attention to what it feels like to walk from your house to the car, what it feels like to have the cold on your my hands are freezing, to have your hand cold on your face. You know, what does that feel like? If you are present to those things in those moments, then you might be able to get yourself to the doctor's office and your anxiety will come along and you will be able to drive uh, wise-mindedly and all of that. So being mindful is a practice and it's a, we want to practice it um, in a way that allows us to, um, take hold of our mind. So the two parts are being in the present and taking hold of our mind. Um, hold on one second. Um, we want to reduce suffering, as I said. And if we can reduce the amount of time we spend suffering, you're reducing suffering. There'll be other ways that we work on reducing suffering, but you can increase happiness because if you're out on a walk and you're thinking about how much you have to do or all your anxiety, then you're not actually getting any happiness that's out there on that walk. You might be missing some really incredible things. There's lots of wildlife that a lot of people started noticing. Um, and also increases our focus when we can take hold of our mind. Take hold of our mind and put it on what we wanna pay attention to. Our anxiety or the task at hand. Okay. Um, Another way of being mindful is using what I call the stop skill. I don't call it the stop skill. DBT has named the stop skill S-T-O-P. It's an acronym. S is to stop. How many times are you in the middle of a, um, whoops, in the middle of a conversation uh, and you're getting, uh, you know, escalating emotions? or you're trying to figure out what to do. And again, the emotions are escalating. So you want to know how to just stop. I put my hand up and I say, stop to myself. Then you take a breath or take a step back. Really things that are logical and make sense. The O, which is new, is to observe what's going on in that moment. So if in that moment, um, I'm gonna give you an example I can think of. I was on a plane recently. And a little while ago, um, <clears throat> back of December, I guess, and I saw people without their masks on, right? And I was sitting on a plane, I'm wearing my mask, and I'm a little concerned. I stopped, I took a breath, I observed what I was feeling. Yeah, I know that that person's not wearing a mask, but I want to know what's going on inside of me, because the only person I can take care of is me. I have to start with me. So at that moment, I observed my tight chest, I observed my angry thoughts. I observed my judgments. I observed my, yeah, a lot of anger, a lot of judgments, like, you know, what's wrong with them? You know, all those 
things that you might know how to, you know, go on in your head. And I observed all that. And then the P is proceed mindfully. How lovely that I get to make a choice. Remember the five ways to respond to a problem? I could have stayed miserable. I could have made it worse. Or I could do some breathing. At that moment, I might just practice one of my mindfulness breathing techniques. One of them would be, I say, inhale in, in my head, and I say, exhale calm on the exhale. You can try that. It's beautiful. Just those two phrases really help guide your breathing. Inhale in, exhale calm. And I say calm and in my head and I feel my body listen to that word. And I try to slow down the word calm as I say it too. So that might be one thing I practice. I might practice my uh, dialectic thinking, which we're going to get to in a few minutes. Um, which is really important when I've got those angry thoughts about, I can't believe that guy is sitting over there without his mask, or why doesn't she pull up her mask? It's, it's not over her nose. Um, and I can have those thoughts and I can say, and they have a right to be on this plane. We're all doing the best we can. Maybe that's the best you can do at this moment. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Um, so we have the stop skill. Um, we have moments of joy. There, you, many people are feeling so overwhelmed, so panicked, so anxious, so depressed, so much grief, whatever it is you're feeling. And no matter how intense it is, even if it's 99% of your day, I'm going to ask you to look for moments of joy because moments of joy add up. One moment of joy at a time adds up. Have you ever heard of the art form of pointillism? Pointillism is you make lots and lots of dots. And the more dots you make, the more you can recognize a picture. So you'll see on one of my slides, there's dots of a tree. It's made with pointillism. You start with one or two dots, you can't tell it's a tree. You start adding 50 dots, it starts to become a tree. So moments of joy add up to help you balance out your life. Remember, I talked about things being out of balance. We need to do those. And I'll bring it up again at the end that a moment that practicing these moment, mindful moments of joy, mindful moments of joy are just take a stop, pause, put a moment in your life. I call it punctuating your life. You can take a pause. You can take a breath. One morning I woke up and this is years ago but I haven't forgotten it because it was a moment of joy. I looked out my window, cold morning, and all of a sudden on the picnic table was, it was ice, little ice particles glimmering in the sunrise. And I stood there and it really wasn't more than five seconds because five seconds can feel like a long time. That moment of joy is imprinted in my mind. I forget what I did last week, but that moment of joy is there. And you can all create moments of joy just by looking around. One of the mindfulness exercises I do in my group is I ask everybody, now that we're in COVID, walk around your room and be curious about something. Find something you haven't seen before in your own house, in your own room. And what is it that you notice? Is it how something is made? Is it the color? Is it is it the quality that you're looking at? So moments of joy can happen as long as we slow down and pay attention. The next thing is, um, and so yes, you can actually try that yourself. But as I said, we want to add a little punctuation in our life. Let me share screens and see if there's anything else I wanted to share about mindfulness before we move on. Oh, yes, these moments of joy, I'm going to read... I did the stop skill. I'm going to read a little poem for you. It's called The Patience of Ordinary Things by Pat Schneider. It is a kind of love, is it not? How the cup holds the tea. How the chair stands sturdy and four square. How the floor receives the bottom of shoes or toes how souls of feet know where they're supposed to be. I've been thinking about the patience of ordinary things, how clothes wait respectfully in closets and soap dries quiet, 
quietly in the dish. And towels drink the wet from the skin of the back. And the lovely repetition of the stairs. And what is more generous than a window? It's important to balance our lives. Oops, wait a minute. It's important to balance our lives with the big, really difficult things that can be overwhelming to think about. You don't know how to solve the, the, the situations in our life. You may not know how to solve social injustice, environmental disease, you know, um, climate change, political unrest, and this pandemic. But you can start putting into the world appreciation, gratitude, and well-being. Let's start with what we can do. Okay. Um, that I'm gonna, that's punctuating your life. There's that little pointillism, one dot at a time makes the whole picture. All right, we're gonna start with radical acceptance. So I'm gonna stop sharing, but again, look at that quick picture of it's raining. There are two responses to it's raining because we're gonna move on to a skill called radical acceptance. Um, okay, I'm just checking the time. The um, one way of responding to it's raining is you've gotta be kidding. It can't be raining. I had plans today. What's wrong with it? It's, it shouldn't be raining. It's gonna ruin my day. Why is this always happening to me? All I wanted was a sunny day. And on the other hand, when you see it's raining, you go, yep. Okay, this one is misery. This one's fighting reality. This is our willfulness of saying, I don't want it to be this way. It shouldn't be this way. And we all have had those feelings during COVID. It shouldn't be this way. I don't want it to be this way. It's ruining everything. Yeah, we don't want a lot of what's going on. On one hand, when we respond with misery, we are fighting reality. We increase our suffering and we make things worse. That is called willfulness. In radical acceptance, we turn our mind. Remember mindfulness? We turn our mind to willingness. This is willfulness and fighting reality. We turn our mind to willingness, to accept reality as it is, not as we want it to be, not as it should be, not as what's fair, but what is. And yes, that's where we get the expression, it is what it is. But we don't say it with defeat. We radically accept and acknowledge that this is here. This is what we are dealing with. We are dealing with anxiety. We're dealing with loss. We're dealing with all these things that are currently in our life. The more we fight it, the more we exhaust ourselves, the more miserable we are, the worse it gets. So you have a choice. You have a choice to be willing, willful, or you have a choice to be willing. And um, this is what we want to work on, is learning how to be willful, willing to accept reality. Accepting it does not mean you are saying you like it. It doesn't mean you like it. You don't have to like this. But it is important to acknowledge that it exists. That the person on, the person not wearing their mask or the person, uh, you know, doing something that I personally don't think they should be doing, that's willful. If, I, if I'm judging that, I have to, that's my willfulness. And it's going to cause me more pain. This is the difference. These two hands, willfulness is our suffering. And this is our pain. There is pain in our lives. Radical acceptance says, I can live with pain. Now, a lot of people in our society want to avoid pain that doesn't really work, right? There are many ways we try to avoid pain. We are a society that tries a lot of avoidance. And that is what brings us into therapy because it doesn't work. If it worked, you wouldn't need me. We could avoid all of our emotions and it might, it might if it worked, then you wouldn't need therapy. But in my office, I have a pillow that says all emotions welcome here because we are humans full of emotions and, and they are sometimes painful and our situations are painful and we haven't caused all our own problems, but we need to radically accept that problems are in our lives and we need to deal with them. And so the willingness, the way I approach something 
And I'm going to give you some ideas of how to do that. The willingness of accepting reality as it is allows us to accept the pain, live with the pain, even lean into the pain in order to be more effective in our lives, in order to be able to get what we want, which is a little bit of peace, a little bit of comfort, and we work on all of that. We don't want to exhaust ourselves out, right? You don't want to be exhausted. And that's where a lot of people are from fighting reality. We feel more burnout. So one of the tricks for dealing with burnout is this radical acceptance and being willy, willing. So I want to do a quick little exercise with you here. Um, I want you to make a fist. I want you to tighten your face. And I want you to be willful. Willful is that kind of you got to be kidding. Really? Is this really happening again? I don't believe here we are in another surge. Everyone's getting it. I can't believe this. And just sort of dig into that, what you don't want this situation to be, whatever it is in your life. And you're being willful and you're going to act willfully. I even recommend walking across the floor in the, your room, walk across the room willful. When you get to the other side, which not, we're not going to do that now, I'm going to open my hands and open my face and take a breath. These are called willing hands. This is called a half smile because I lift my face and I take a breath. And when I do, it tells my brain, it's going to be all right. We're in this together. I'm not alone. We can manage day by day, one day at a time. I've been through this. I'll get through it again. I can handle this. That's what happens. I didn't make up those things. When you open your hands, you open your face and you lift the sides of your mouth almost imperceptibly and you take a breath. Your brain tells you you're okay. What a great message. It's like having your loving parent give you a hug. It is that kind of willing hands, half smile, communicates to our brain, I can handle this. I can live with my pain. It's a trick. It's not a magic wand. You've got to practice, practice, practice. So opening your hands, half smile, you can do it when you roll out of bed and you're just like, not another day, or you got to sit on the screen again because you have another meeting and you're like, I don't want to do this. I just don't want to do this. All right. Guess I got to do it, getting paid to do this, that kind of thing. So whatever it is, you'll see that the thoughts come to your mind. All right, let's move on from radical acceptance to the big one. The big one, they're all big. These are all these skills are big. Um, the big one is called dialectics, dialectic thinking and dialectic. We act dialectically and we think dialectically. So dialectics, which is what this therapy is called, dialectic behavior therapy, is changing the way we see or perceive a problem. That's really important. That's really, really important because dialectic thinking replaces dichotomous thinking. And here in America, we are raised to think dichotomously. A lot of things in our society teach us right, wrong, good, bad, um, failure, success, um, all or nothing, extreme language of always, never. That's dichotomous thinking. And it gets us in trouble. Because if I wake up and I have a bad hair day or I just in a bad mood and I say, ah, I hate my hair, right? If that's all I can think, then that could ruin my day. It's powerful, our thoughts. We can believe those thoughts that we hear in our heads. But if I, <coughs> excuse me, if I, um, if I don't think about good and bad or right and wrong or all or nothing, I might feel a little bit more balanced. So what is dialectic thinking? Dialectic thinking is very complicated and it, there's a lot of definitions on the slides that I'm not gonna go over, but I hope that you read. Um, dialectic thinking holds two opposite ideas, thoughts, or feelings at the same time. Two opposites can be both true at the same time. That's one part of the definition. Another part of the definition is 
many perspectives can exist, coexist simultaneously. My reasons for wearing masks or getting vaccine or doing whatever I'm doing can exist in a world where someone chooses to get one vaccine, but not two vaccines or wear the mask part of the way or wear the mask some of the time. All kinds of things can exist. There's truth in every perspective that's out there. That's hard for us to believe that there is some truth. There's a kernel of truth in all sides. And the third part of the definition is that there's always missing information. That's pretty relaxing because if you don't know it all, that takes the pressure off of you of knowing it all. So when someone is behaving in such a way, whether that's my spouse or whether it's my child or whether it's my friend or my neighbor or someone across the political aisle, if I remember that I don't understand, I might be missing some information, that makes a difference. These are some spiritual practices. Dialectic thinking can be very much of a spiritual practice because it reminds us that we're all connected and that there is missing information. There are sometimes things that we don't know. And that's an important thing to hold on to, especially when you're anxious. You're anxious because you want to know it all. But if you already give yourself permission that I'm not going to know it all, there's missing information, then we don't get quite so upset when they say, oh, now we're going from 10 days of quarantine to five days of quarantine. Or now we can, you can't wear your cloth mask, you need to go out and get an NKN95 or a surgical mask. I mean, things can change because we didn't have all the information. And all of a sudden, we don't have to blame anyone for not giving us the right information. We did, there was missing information. Um, so there are many perspectives that are true at the same time. When we think dialectically, we can get along. When we think di dichotomously, and I'm having a conversation with myself, or with someone else, someone's gotta be right and someone's gotta be wrong. Someone's gotta be good and someone's gotta be bad. It's like, that's how it's set up and it doesn't really work well. So things escalate, your emotions escalate, uh, interpersonal situations escalate, um, it's, it, it polarizes us. So instead, when we think dialectically, things change. Think, if you have a piece of paper, write down the number six. And if you don't have a piece of paper, imagine you're looking on the table where you are and you're looking down and you see, uh, you know, in your lap or in your hand, the number six. Now imagine someone across from you comes and looks at that number six. What do they see? They see a number nine, right? Especially if it's, it's a curvy six, right? Um, actually, I have a slide that you might want to see. That six is um, a nine to someone else. That's a radical acceptance. Here we go. Here it is. Um, just because you are right doesn't mean I am wrong. You just have to see things from, you haven't seen things from my side. So here we have two opposite numbers, one person thinks it's six, one person thinks it's nine, and they're both, there's truth in both of their sides. So it's just a great little, quick little version of dialectic thinking. Um, it's really important, I have used the magic and. So now we're gonna try a little practice of using and. Watch this, let me get rid of the screen again. Um, so I'm gonna do an experiment with you. If I ask you, how are you, right? Everybody sees each other and says, how, 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 how are you? We usually answer with, I'm fine. Okay, typical. I'm going to still keep saying I'm fine. But then listen to these answers and tell me if you feel any different when you hear them. Or if you said them. I'm fine. And I've made significant changes in my life due to COVID. I'm fine. And I'm struggling with not seeing my family again. I'm fine and I'm totally depressed with how things are going. I'm fine and don't you know what to, and I, oh, sorry. I'm fine and I don't know what to do with myself. Which answer is more inviting? Just I'm fine? Which one makes you feel more connected? 
How does it make you feel when you hear it? They're not dumping all their problems on you. I'm fine and I'm struggling with not seeing my family again. Like both those things can be true. Like I'm fine, I'm moving forward in my life. I'm waking up, I'm doing what I need to do and I'm struggling and I'm struggling or and I'm depressed and I'm finding, you know, we can have these two opposites exist at the same time. There's the magic of and. And allows you to hold and bring them together. This is a yes and situation, not a but or situation. But or puts us back in um, dichotomous thinking. Yes and is the dialectic thinking. Both things can be true. Okay, um, that's dialectics and it helps us get along with people. It helps us process our emotions. I'm anxious and I can do it anyway. Um, you know, feel that there's a book title called feel the, feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. That's dialectic. The quote at the end of my lecture tonight is dialectic. When I started today, when I said, oh, I really don't like talking to a screen and a green dot. I want to talk to people in front of me. And I'm so excited to be here sharing this information with all of you out there. That's a dialectic statement. That's what we're going for. And that will help you balance, bring balance into your life. It's the I can't handle this throws you all the way off course. It's like standing on one leg and trying to go through life. Dialectic thinking gives you a perspective of feeling like you have both feet on the ground. It helps you ground. We need that. We need to be grounded when our emotions are escalating. So this dialectic thinking gives you permission to hold both maybe the positive things and the negative. And they don't both have to be negative. They don't have to be, you don't have to make it positive. You can just say, this is really hard and I'm doing the best I can. Well, maybe that was positive. Okay, play with that. Make some dialectic statements. Practice, practice, practice. As a matter of fact, let me give you one second while I have another drink of water. Take a moment to see if you can think of a dialectic statement. Something about how you're feeling. It's not so easy. I've had a lot of practice. And I would get some volunteers, but I can't. So I'll just imagine you're doing, you're practicing. Okay, if you don't know what to say, this stinks or I can't handle this, you can always add and I'm okay and this shall pass and I can handle it or I will handle it. So if you don't know what to say to do the dialectic and add what comes after the and, I'm okay. I started teaching this skill to my three-year-old, to my grandson who's now six, but I've been teaching it to him since he's three, okay? I've really been, you know, pounding it is you don't want to go, you don't want to do it and, you know, we're going to go outside and come back to playing or whatever. All right, um, the next skill, let's see where we are. Let's see where our skill uh, is all about validation. I think that's where we are. We did... Changing the way you see, there's our definition. You can go back over and reading it. Benefits of dialectic thinking, beautiful. Oh, there's my little critter. Um, I don't want to cry. And we changed the book to say, so I did. And I was brave and sad. Okay, validation. Um, I am gonna explain to you instead of having you read. Validation is when we let somebody know Either it can be self-validation or it could be other validation. When I'm with someone, we let someone know that we understand them. But what happens when someone comes to you and says, I am, you know, like my best friend came and said, I can't believe we canceled the wedding for the fifth time. I don't know what we're going to do. You know, I just so disappointed. I was crying. I can try and give her advice. I can say, you know, you've done a great job. You're going to do, you're fine. Everything's going to be great. We're going to be fine. The way, you know, whatever. I can just do that. But what am I doing is I'm driving right by her emotions. I'm trying to help her avoid her emotions. I'm trying to fix the problem. 
And this is not when I always want to fix the problem. We have feelings that want to be acknowledged. People want want to be acknowledged. We have a huge need as human beings to be seen and heard and understood. You know, how many times have I had a fight with my husband? <laughs> and all I want to say is just listen, I just want to be heard and I want to be understood. That's what validation is. Okay. And there are many ways of validating, but validating is not fixing the problem. It's not giving advice. It's not even giving a compliment to someone to make them feel better. It's simply acknowledging and letting someone know that you understand what they are feeling, what they are thinking, what they may, what they may have, how they may have acted. You validate the valid, as we say in the industry. Um, but validation, people have a really hard time with it because it, they think it's agreement. So I can validate. Um, someone once told me that wearing a mask felt like they couldn't breathe. They felt claustrophobic. And I can validate, wow, I would really understand why, wearing a, why you would not want to wear a mask and why wearing a mask for you is really hard. I'm not condoning a behavior. Oh, don't wear a mask. You shouldn't wear a mask if that's the way you feel. I'm just acknowledging what I heard and understanding what they, I'm showing them that I'm listening. I'm showing that I understand that they that their feelings can make sense, right? Um, so we can acknowledge. What do we validate? We validate thoughts, feelings, behaviors. And um, in the six and nine experiment, in that little experiment, I can say, well, I get why you might think that's a nine. My version, it's a six, but I get why your version, it's a nine. So it's validating to be able to say, I get it. Another way we can validate someone is we can simply pay attention. If um, I'm in the kitchen and my husband's trying to talk to me, if I am on my phone, if I am, you know, going to the pantry to get food, if I am someone's trying to talk to me and I'm doing everything but looking at them, they may not feel like they're being understood. It's very invalidating. We don't want to help we don't want to make people feel invalidated. We want people to feel validated when we're in context with them. And it, we don't have to agree with people. So this is something that can help us bridge some gaps, bridge some gaps in terms of polarization and extremes. We can connect to people in ways that makes sense. We can listen to people. We don't have to agree, but we can listen. We can reflect back. So one way of validation is just paying attention. Another way of validating is active listening and reflecting back what you've heard. And you can start with something like, oh, it sounds like you feel frustrated that people weren't wearing their mask. It sounds like you feel incredibly sad that something got canceled for the third time. Um, another level is showing interest in can you tell me more why that's so hard for you? Can you tell me more about that? That's it's validating for someone to ask and act interested in what you're talking about. So validation is not so simple. Again, I'm not teaching you the simple skills. I'm teaching you the helpful skills. Why is validation so important? Because it is incredible. It's like a magic wand when people are escalating and you don't have to have an enemy to escalate your emotions. You can be talking to the people you love and emotions are escalating. Just living in the house, not getting out very often, um, being on top of each other. I had one family living in a one bedroom apartment with a three-year-old and a five-year-old. It was like, not easy. This is the beginning of COVID. That was not easy. So there is tension and escalation. And if we validate, it is magic how you bring down people's emotions. So if someone is screaming at you, um, you don't understand, and you stop and say, can you tell me what I don't understand? You're going to probably get them to listen. I mean, probably get them to de-escalate. If the problem is we try to do that dichotomous thing, which is I'm telling you why I'm right and you're wrong, and we keep going at each other. But if we change our mindset to think more flexibly, to think that you've got a version and I've got a version. And when we're escalating and I see someone reacting, I'm thinking they're not being seen and heard and understood. 
So I'm going to step back. I'm going to use my stop skill. I'm going to step back and I'm going to notice that I'm escalating too. And I'm going to stop and I'm maybe just going to validate. I'm just going to reflect back what I hear. So I notice that you're getting really upset right now. I notice that you're angry that whatever happened. And when we do that, again, it's not the satisfaction of fixing a problem. But when you see people de-escalate, you will feel really competent and capable. And you can do this for yourself. So I had a little meltdown at five o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> I wanted to eat dinner early and I started getting my mo little stressed right before this and my emotions are high and my dinner wasn't ready. It is one of my vulnerabilities. If I don't eat and I'm hungry, I get very irritable. I know that about myself. Um, what was the point of me telling you this? Um, oh, I validated myself. Okay. A little self-validation is you don't want to be screaming. You don't want to be upset. And it really makes sense right now. And there's that magic. And, and it really makes sense that you might be a little irritable, that you might've gotten short that you, you know, and you acted the way you did. So I self-validated. I didn't give myself permission to act that way. I didn't say, "Ugh, he can take it. Don't worry about it. No, I just validated the valid part, which is I get Leslie, why I'm, why I felt irritable, why I was stressed, why I may have reacted the way I did. And it's being kind to ourselves. Validation is that kindness to ourselves and to others. Usually people have a harder time self-validating than they do with other people. Um, so validation is not about adding your own two cents. It's just about listening. Oh, see, this is what I did. I, I'm running out of time. Okay. Um, putting validation and dialectic together, validation and dialectics together means you're walking a middle path. You're trying to balance things out. Um, let me see. Um, I've heard a lot of people saying that I can't forgive myself. I got COVID. I passed it on. I'm so irresponsible. You can validate that. I can see that you're really upset with yourself. I, I get this has been a really difficult time. It's, it's a struggle to know how to respond, you know, and dialectically. And I don't think that was your intention to get anyone sick. Um, so let me move on to the last section. Not too bad. Um, about building emotional bank. By the way, I hope that if you have questions, you can put them in the Q and A. I will at, you know, in just a few minutes, I will start taking your questions and I will show you how we can put these skills into practice with your real life experiences that you want, that you have a question about, or you just have a question about something I've talked about. So the last section, <clears throat> let's share the screen again. Um, okay, so that was validation. I have a few Leslie lines, like all of my Leslieisms. They're great. A lot of them are dialectic. Look at the one, the first one, learning to be comfortable in an uncomfortable situation. Those are two opposites that I'm putting together. Learning to be comfortable in an uncomfortable situation. Um, uh, your emotions are a part of you, not all of you. These, these are really fun little things that you can look over and use by all means. So now we're talking about filling your emotional bank. Why do we want to fill your emotional bank? Because when there's, bank, there's money in the bank, it helps us when it's a rainy day and we need to pull money out to fix the car, to repair something in the house, to go to a doctor's appointment. We need that balance between dealing with the difficult, uncomfortable stuff and the stuff that feels good. And as I spoke about in the beginning, those moments of joy are ways to start filling up the emotional bank. I, um, I use the cup here to call it a cup of enoughness so that you can just check in with yourself and anytime you want to see how you're feeling, take a picture, pour your glass and say, how, much, how full do I feel right now? And if you're not feeling so great and the cup is low, come to these skills, build, accumulate some positive experiences because it means you're running on empty, right? You don't have enough in the bank for a rainy day and to deal with all these big emotions that we're dealing with. So you want to do things that fill your cup and fill your bank, your emotional bank and balance things out. 
Okay. So that we can live with both the vulnerability of the difficult emotions and the positive things in our life. Um, <clears throat> some ideas are, this is a chart that I give out in my group. It's called, it's part of the course called Plan Pleasant Event Diary. And I put it here because I want you to fill out this diary card. It's you you intentionally plan something pleasant every day. You notice whether you actually did it or not, or something get in the way. Like I bet very few people have been out walking on these last few days. A lot of people say, oh, it's too cold. It's too rainy. It's too sunny. It's too hot. Well, can you have an attitude of do it anyway? What happens if you walk when it's hot? What happens if you walk when it's raining with a raincoat and an umbrella and rubber boots? So sometimes <clears throat> it makes sense to change a planned pleasant event. And sometimes it's like, no, I'm not going to let anything get in the way. That's just a small point. The other point that's really important about doing something pleasant is one that it's intentional. That means you deserve. You deserve to take care of yourself. It's called self-care. And it's really important. We're worried about everybody else. That's very important that we are a collective and we're, we're thinking about how we affect each other. This is a really positive thing that's coming out of COVID is for us to remember that we are connected and that my actions will affect everybody else's um, and that we are all connected. So a planned pleasant event says, I'm also important and I need to take care of myself in order to be healthy for others. So in order to do that, you need to make time for yourself and plan it. And you need to be mindful to the pleasantness of it. How many of you go on vacation? We just got done with some holidays and you're on vacation. And on day five, if let's say a day three out of a five day vacation, you start going, oh my God, I go back to work in two days. I can't believe I go back to work in two days. what did you just do to your vacation? You became unmindful to it. You became unmindful to the pleasantness and you became mindful to the worries. So in this exercise and on this chart, you pay attention and you rate your mindfulness to the pleasant um, event and you let go of your worries. So you learn to be unmindful. Again, shifting your attention to the present. So this is a really helpful um, activity to do. So building mastery I, I love the, you know, people were getting haircuts and, and they got to say, I did something new. And it was really exciting. Whether you watched a YouTube to learn how to do something new, whether you, you tried it on your own. But when we do something new, we nourish ourselves. And again, that's how we can put, you know, add money to that emotional bank. And what's so important is we change our definition of success. We need to say, I did it, not, I did it perfectly. I did it are my three favorite words. I use those words again. I've been teaching my grandson who doesn't like to try something unless he's already good at it. And there are a lot of people out there like that, that if they don't do something well, they don't want to try. And so I get so excited when he tries something that he's either scared of or he doesn't think he's good enough. And I go after he's done, I said, where are my three favorite words? And he says, I did it. And then you can see that big grin on his face. You can try something like a 30 day challenge. I've been doing this, not a lot, but a little bit once I read someone's idea and I did things like pet my cat. It doesn't have to be big. Now I pet my cat regularly, but I did it as a 30 day challenge. And it was so cool because it was like, wow, that was a nice experience to make a little time for it. Again, doesn't take a lot of time. I go feed her. I can pet her after she's done eating or before feeding her. Um, I did one with my nephew during COVID where we said we were gonna walk outside for a month, go, in the, um, go outside at dark and look up at the sky. Maybe see stars, maybe see clouds, maybe feel rain, but walk outside every night. Now, guess what? I didn't do, I didn't pet the cat every single day and I didn't pet and I didn't go outside every single day, but I did it for 30 days more or less. And I believe in giving myself partial credit. If I waited till I did everything the way I should do it, like 30 days, the only way I get credit is if I do it all 30 days, I wouldn't be very effective in my life. I would give up a lot. So give yourself partial credit, do it good enough, 
and say to yourself, I did it. Because when we do it, we can build. And that is a good example of that is I did one minute yoga a day. I couldn't get around to doing yoga. I didn't have time for it. I didn't like it. I got hurt all the time. So I just started doing one minute yoga a day. And I didn't do it every day. I did it sometime. But I did it enough that I built mastery, not became a master. There's a difference between building mastery and becoming a master. So all I did was build mastery. I felt good about accomplishing something. All right. So let's move on. Let's finish up with remember your breath. If you own your own breath, no one can steal your peace. And I know we're all looking for a little bit more space, a little bit more peace in these difficult, heavy times. Those, um, I got them right here. These are um, like marble coasters. They're pretty heavy. So as you can see, you just put them to that balloon between them and it gets all the air out of it. And that's what we feel. That's the pressure we feel with uh, COVID and what's happening in our society, we can feel a lot of pressure. So in order to tolerate and move forward, remember to give yourself a breath and find your moment of peace. Um, and I'll end with, before we go on to questions, life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass. It's about learning to dance in the rain. And I have a passion for dancing. I have a passion for rain but putting them together is when we're having difficult times, find a way to, to lean into the painfulness of it and don't wait, don't avoid your life. Keep moving forward during these difficult times. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, and I'd love to hear some of your questions. My if, your, your quest, we do have questions. Mm -hmm. um, one second, I just want to try to join you on okay. the screen. Um, so our first question is, how do we deal with severe health anxiety? Okay. Um, we can get a caught up on the word health anxiety because we think that we have to worry if, we, if it's about health. It's anxiety and we want to deal with anxiety as we deal with most emotions, which is we want to observe and describe our emotions. We want to understand, I get anxious when it comes to dealing with health issues. Health issues are just your prompting event for the emotion. So understanding and naming. So it's called, it's what I call observe and describe. That's the DBT language. Or notice it and name it. So when that anxiety shows up, learn about it. Oh, I get anxious because I just read that there's a new strand of COVID or that it's not going away or that there's such a thing as long COVID and you're getting aroused. But remember that the health sort of step back and remember that the health piece is your prompting event. Now you're going to deal with anxiety. And dealing with anxiety, the way I just mentioned it, is do your stop skill. What happens when you get anxious? What happens? Stop and observe what's going on in your body. You probably breathe shallow. You probably have some negative thoughts. You probably are maybe hyperventilating. Um, and what I would do is I would use dialectic thinking. So I might say, this really scares me. And... I can lean on my friend. This really scares me. And I can, um, this really scares me and I can handle it. This really scares me. And this is my anxiety talking. So those are a few ways. Again, I'm gonna lean on the skills that I've just taught, but one of them is dialectic thinking. And then our mindfulness, which is, okay, my anxiety's up. Can I shift my attention? Because right now I'm, let's say I'm, um, I'm, I'm feeding my kids dinner and I hear some, something comes up on my phone about some new health issue and I get prompted and my anxiety goes up. I want to be able to shift my attention back to dinner and say, you know what, I'm going to put that down and I'm going to come back to it because right now I'm going to shift my attention to my kids, to my dinner, to this meal and I'm gonna really use my muscle of mindfulness. It is a muscle. I, if you asked me to do five push-ups right now, I couldn't do them. 
can't even do three. So um, the point is, is that you want to work and work and work to practice that shifting of your attention, because the more you do it, the more you can regulate that anxiety. These are skills that get us from emotion mind to wise mind. Wise mind helps us deal with our life. Emotion mind is, hello, emotion mind. Hello, anxiety. I know you're here. You're a part of me. You're not all of me. So when your health anxiety shows up, it's a part of you. It feels like, do I have my blanket here? It feels like if I put a blanket all over me, I'm going to do it because I'm going to show you. It feels like when that health anxiety shows up, it feels like this is where I am. Oh my God, I can't breathe. I can't see. I can't function right? It feels like it's all of me. It feels like I'm totally engulfed in it, but you're not. It's a part of you. Talk to it. That's my anxiety talking. And I know why it's here. Validate myself. My validation is maybe it makes sense in my history. Maybe it makes sense because I don't understand things. So you want to validate yourself. You want to think dialectically. You want to remind yourself it's part of you, not all of you. Thanks, Leslie. Yeah. Another question is how to deal with thoughts that if we don't focus on the negative and don't is capitalized and everything that can go wrong, we are jinxing ourselves. I don't know if I exactly understand the question. So it means if I have negative thoughts, am I going to make those things happen? Is that it's a little bit of that. Um, mm -hmm. I worry a little bit that, and I know there has been some thinking about that, where you don't want to have a negative thought because it might come true. That's not true. Okay. I mean, I believe that if we're very, very fearful, we might walk into our fears because it's all we see, right? I want to get the fear out of my way so I can actually see where I want to go, not where my fear wants to take me. But I think our thoughts are just thoughts. They're not facts. The thought that I'm having is a fact that I have a thought is a fact, but the thought itself is not a fact, right? So we have another DBT skill, which I did not teach and I call check the facts, find another interpretation. But I want to remember a thought is just a thought. And in mindfulness, when we practice, we practice Teflon mind. Teflon mind is just like a Teflon pan. The eggs, you know, will uh, fly right out. We just want these thoughts to come in and go out. When I have a thought, I don't want this to happen or something negative, I might make it a sticky thought and I might ruminate on it and think it over and over again. I'm going to work to make it a, a, um, a Teflon thought. That's what I would recommend. It's not, you know, I'm not going to, I'm going to try to take away the power that the thought has and give my mindfulness skills the power to feel in control and capable. Good, thank you. Um, and what is the best technique for a panic attack? Okay, so first you have to understand what's happening because many people do not know what's happening. Um, so first I would notice it and name it again. And um, what does work for a panic attack is a type of breathing called paced breathing. Um, there are different skills for different people. Paced breathing, I mean, again, if I was to use the skills I just taught, you can be dialectic. I'm having a panic attack and this will pass. That's going to help anyone having a panic attack because they think the worst part about having a panic attack is I can't get out of this feeling. This is going to last forever. If I just say to myself over and over again, this is a panic attack and it will pass. I'm okay. This is a panic attack and I'm okay. This is a panic attack and I don't like it and it will pass. So just really talking to yourself can be one thing that helps you through a panic attack. Um, the mindfulness, I have had people have panic attacks in my office. And one thing that I've done, I teach many things, but I have lots of plants. You can't see them right here. I have lots of plants and I'll say, why don't you count the leaves on the plant? And they start, they're really upset because a panic attack is a full body response. And they're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now it's not quite that dramatic, but it is that dramatic. You can bring someone down by changing the thoughts. 
So you can get someone to count something. You can get something to name all the red things in the room. Um, but pace breathing is the last one I'll teach you. I taught you the inhale in and the exhale calm, but pace breathing is when we exhale twice as long as we inhale. So if I breathe in for two counts, I'm gonna try to exhale for four. And then as I breathe in and I keep breathing, I might try to inhale for three and exhale for six. Doesn't have to be exact. I find some people having a panic attack have a hard time um, breathing because they are having a hard time breathing. So I like to do change the thoughts. That's what I would recommend. Great, thank you. So practical. Yeah. Um, and then also there's a question about whether you do end <clears throat> excuse me, individual therapy and are you accepting new patients? <laughs> <laughs> um, I've given many lectures where I say I'm not accepting new patients. Um, <clears throat> I do do individual therapy. My practice is full and it opens and it's full and it's very fluid. So what I say is um, please reach out to me. My email is, I have to remember, Leslie Cohen, Leslie Cohen Ruberry at gmail.com. Yeah. Yes, yes. And it's in the chat. If anybody wants to look at it, it's in the chat. Leslie okay, Cohen I hope that's Ruberry my email. Oh my goodness. I hope that's my email. And um, I have two emails. I think that's the work one, but it, definitely I know my website It's lesliecohenruberry.com. Go to my, uh, go to my website and my contact information is all there. So um, you can reach out to me. Uh, as I said, I teach these groups and um, groups are available. I do them. Other people do them. DBT skills groups are such wonderful things for teaching people how to deal with emotions. Right, Leslie. And also, um, I do have a participant who's raised her hand. Yes. And may I allow her to, to ask her question? Okay. Absolutely. So Patty, um, you can unmute yourself and you can ask your question. I can't unmute you, but I have allowed you to talk. So and she So sometimes I, it may have happened inadvertently that she raised her hand, but you're welcome, oh. to, you're welcome to talk if you'd like to, Patty. Right, that might've yeah. happened. Yeah. But, so Leslie, that, those are all of our questions at this. Oh, I'm sorry, no, there is one more, excuse me. Okay. Validation for different views of vaccination when you have no interest in delving into their point of view. Great. Um, just as our emotions are not all of us, people's opinions about vaccinations is not all of them. And yes, we do not have to agree with someone else's uh, beliefs and um, actions. And we still want to remember that we share this planet together, that we share similarities, that they have people that they care about, that they have pain and they want happiness. Um, I was uh, honored to be able to go hear the Dalai Lama speak in Danbury probably 15 years ago or something when he was here. And he came out on stage and he said, everybody calls me the holiness and they make me feel like I'm different. And he said, I don't wanna be different. I'm just like you. I have pain and I want happiness. We all want those two things. And so, um, I forgot what I was talking about. Um, the person said, right, the person said, how do, you, how do you deal with it? How do you validate that? I might not validate it. The way I could validate it is that person has a right to their own version of how they're gonna live their life. I might not agree with it. Validation is not agreement. I do not have to agree with the way they live their life, but I can validate that they have a right to live their life. And yes, it may affect others in a very serious way, big consequences. And I want to remember that guess what? I'm I am not, I am I'm living my life and I am leading consequences on this planet as well. I drive a car, I fly an airplane, I am a polluter, I do as much as I can, I'm doing the best I can, but I have, I'm not doing, you know, somebody can judge me for what I'm doing. So I don't want to forget that we're all human. And we all make mistakes and we all have pain. And yes, we have different ways of being in the world. And if we can work on connecting in other ways, which is really hard, 
then maybe we can start to heal the polarization, the polarization that's pulling us apart and that doesn't get us to talk to each other about the difficult subjects. So there are skills in DBT that teach us how to, um, that definitely teach us how to uh, use communication and there's more to that. So it's a really good question. And sometimes we want to have flexible thinking. So I think outside the box. So I broaden, I, I use my flexible thinking, my dialectic thinking, and I think, wait a minute, that person's a human being as well. And I don't remember all that missing information. I don't know, I don't exactly know what their history was, what their trauma was, what their life story is. It's not me, I, you know, so there are things that I can think about and it's not easy to tolerate that, just that anger in ourselves, which is real, validate it. I have a right to be angry about the way people are behaving. Maybe that will lead to my action, my political action, my um, supporting, doing whatever I can to support. How can this lead me to action? How can that make me feel more capable or more, um, you know, effective in this world. We've all, we all have challenges and I, I get it. And it's about doing what we can and taking control of our emotions because, you know, it often is someone will come to me for therapy and say, you know, you got to work on my son's anger. And, you know, he's screaming at me and he's telling me the story. And I was screaming at him this afternoon because I was like, yeah, yes, I can work on your son's anger. Let me help you with your anger. Come in, start working on your anger, then maybe we'll help your son's anger. So we wanna to remember to be flexible, to be honest, to look at ourselves, to work on ourselves and be the change. As Gandhi said, be the change we wanna see in the world. That's do the best you can, show up as your best self. That's what we can do. And that helps us deal with these tough, tough times. Thank you. And another question is, um, I think it is so important that you said there's missing information because sometimes I think our division is happening because we each think we know all the right information. Ah, there we go. And we think we know all the right information which gets us back into that dichotomous world. I'm right, they're wrong. And you know, there's a lot of work going on right now in the field of psychology about trauma and how much trauma that people are dealing with. And so sometimes we see these ways of thinking and being in the world because people are really traumatized. And when we are traumatized, we are fearful. And we are fearful, we make emotion-minded decisions, not wise-minded decisions. So it is very important for us to, um, say again what the question was, I forgot a second. Um, I, I think it's so important that you said there's missing information oh, because right. sometimes I think our division is happening because we each think we all know all the right information. Right. So we want to practice the dialectic, the missing information, the flexible thinking, and, um, and hold on to that. It'll help us even with the person that we think we know so well. You know, I don't care how long you've been married, you think you know everything about that person. Just remember you're missing information. Your day may get more interesting. <laughs> Ask a question that says, hey, I thought I knew you, but can you tell me how, why, why you may have done what you just did? Um, I have a line in my lesson lines in one of the handouts that says, you must have a very good reason for. Mm -hmm. That's a way to get to some of that missing information. Don't ask them, why did you do that? Like, why aren't you wearing a mask? You're going to make them defensive. You're going to make them think that you're judging. You're going to make them think you're judging them. But if you say, you must have a very good reason for not wearing a mask, I bet they'll open up. I bet they might talk to you. And maybe you'll learn something. And maybe you'll get part of an answer. You won't get all of it because we're still missing information. Good, good to remember to think about that. Thank okay. you. Well, Leslie, thank you. This has been amazing this evening. You've given us so much. Um, I think COVID is, can be so overwhelming at times. And now I feel we have a treasure trove of tools at our disposal to help us. So thank you. I want to thank you for inviting me. I want to thank everybody for showing up. That's the first act of self-care. And thank everybody for showing up, being here tonight. Um, 
you know, Elaine, thank you for everything you do and the programming committee does at the Mark Twain Library. You've got fantastic programs. I recommend that people go and look at the website and sign up for more of their fantastic programs. Um, also, a uh, thank you to WPKN because they were going to air this tonight. And I just want to say it's anything we can do to help people get information, get resources that they don't have access to. Someone asked the question early on about um, individual, whatever. You also can write me for referrals. You never know. I might have room. I have room in my groups. You can reach out because I'm, I'm here to help. And I do want to, you know, give people information and help people get information that's helpful. That's, that's important. It is. And Leslie's slides are available on her website. So visit her website if you need the slides. And also we will have this posted, this presentation posted on our YouTube channel. So check that in about a week. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure Thanks. to be here tonight. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Leslie. Good night, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night.